Hello and welcome to another By the Book episode of Say by the 90s. My name is Adam Patterson. With me today is a guy who clamors for a jury duty summons, Ken Bakley. Hey, Ken. Hello. This month on the show, we'll be taking a look at four courtroom comedies released throughout the decade. So get ready for some legal goofs and gaffes because this is Say by the 90s. Come on! Don't get that, Frank. It could be the office. Yeah, let it rain. Uh, hello? <coughs> Baxter! It's Baxter! Meow, 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 meow. Meow Mix brand cat food has a variety of four delicious flavors cats love. In fact, it's the only cat food that tastes so good, cats ask for it by name. Again and again. First up, we have an ambitious, yet perhaps, perhaps, perhaps misguided adaptation of a wildly popular Tom Wolfe novel. Released on December 21st, 1990, and directed by Brian De Palma, this is The Bonfire of the Vanities. On Wall Street, he's master of the universe. He's a down-and-out reporter. One night, with the wrong girl, he took a wrong turn. And since then, nothing's gone right. I'm going to jail, aren't I? Now, Go get him. one man's misfortune is causing another man's fame. Tom Hanks, Bruce Willis, Melanie Griffith. Just watch the sparks fly. The Bonfire of the Vanities, rated R. Starts Friday, December 21st at a theater near you. After his mistress runs over a young teen, a Wall Street hotshot sees his life unravel in the spotlight and attracts the interest of a down-and-out reporter. Ken, why don't you kick us off? What were your initial impressions of the bonfire of the vanities? For some reason, I always want to drop the the, and I just want to say bonfire of the vanities. What's I don't know funny why. is when I was watching this, like on the, on the VOD platform, uh, whenever I would move the cursor up to see like the timeline to see how much more of this I had to watch, it just said Bonfire of the Vanities for the title, so. Yeah, I don't know why, but I just... Yeah. Like, I just naturally want to drop the the. Anyway, yeah. what what did you uh, think about this one? <laughs> um, So, I watched this yesterday, and... During it, I messaged you and talked about it, and you were also watching it, mm -hmm. and we talked about it, and uh, we both had the similar experience that this took us more than two hours and five minutes or however long it is to watch just because you you can't watch this movie for two hours. Nah, it's just, it's, uh, it's, there's too much. There's just yeah. way too much yeah. going yeah. on in I, this, in this movie. I, I think... I think what's telling about this very bad movie is that if you go on and you hear people talking about it today, uh, they'll usually talk about it in the context of how movies that are unfairly maligned, well, some people feel unfairly maligned upon the release or become infamous upon the release, they eventually get reassessed by people who believe it was unfairly maligned and kind of give it a second life, a reappraisal. And it's just everyone noticing how they cannot find a single person anywhere who has tried to do that for the bonfire of the vanities. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of those movies that I think could be reevaluated and, and maybe, you know, some something can be gleamed from it. Like, uh, I, I don't know, has Ishtar been? Is, has that been reevaluated? Has. I think, I think has Ishtar, it? that's the example I was going to come up with, how I think especially in the last 10 years, that movie's reputation has really, really moved up. That's what I kind of thought, but I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think, uh, yeah, this one, it's, <laughs> it's, it's because there's very little. And I mean, we talked about Showgirls also on this on this show and how that that movie yeah. has, has sort of found a new audience and is being sort of reevaluated in a, in a much more positive manner. Uh, this movie, I think, will not... I don't think no. that there's ever going to be a time when this gets reevaluated and is, you know, is good. <laughs> like where, it, where they're good. just like, you know what? We were wrong about the bonfire <laughs> of the vanities. It's actually a good movie. Now I haven't read the novel. I heard, no. I, I, I had heard that, you know, people love the novel and maybe that's one of the reasons that uh, people were so harsh on this one. At least that's what I thought going into it. 
then I quickly realized that it's not just that, although that may be a factor as well. Uh, the I think a lot of people also have a hard time with the casting of this. That's another common thing was that, you know, Tom and Hanks, casting. Tom Hanks is playing a, a bad guy, which doesn't really work at all. Uh, you don't expect Tom Hanks to be this kind of womanizing yuppie. Yeah, you, know, you have and then uh, you have Kim Cattrall playing the his girlfriend, I or it's his wife actually. Um, and it's like the, I think yeah. that the, the problems with this is that it, I, I likely it worked really well as a novel where you have the, the story of the, the reporter who's working on this story of this hit and run incident. And then you have the, the, the court case and all of the sort of, minutia of that along with the social commentary aspect of it, like where this was uh, a black male that got run over. It was in the Bronx, but it was a rich white person who did it. And sort of the, uh, the sociopolitical aspect of it. But the problem with the movie, and I'm sure that this all works very nicely in in the novel, but in the movie, uh, I had a really hard time kind of pinning down what the movie was really trying to say. It seemed that it was just constantly flip flopping its messaging, and I couldn't really find the commentary in there. And then sometimes it felt more like satire, which also felt incredibly tone deaf. So yeah. I had a, I had a really hard time pinning this down as far as the messaging. Yeah. It, I think people really were kind of out after the, the, the satirical attempts of this movie in 1990. And if the like media is kind of the, 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 the media establishment of 1990 was saying that the satire was bad. You can imagine what it feels like to watch this movie in 2022. It's pretty hideous. It's pretty brutal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> And, and some of it just makes no, like some of it's just kind of baffling the the choices, the one, the there's one scene where the, the mayor just drops the end bomb for like no reason. Like it does not have to be there. And you're just like, what is going on here? Like this is supposed to be a comedy, but I'm not laughing. I don't think people in 1990 were laughing at it either. It's, it is just an astonishingly like, Hard to follow and tone deaf and bafflingly made movie just on a structural, like, moment-to-moment -moment level. Like, nothing here really works. And sometimes you look at it and you think, I don't think I'd want that to work. None of it. It's all so scattershot, too. The movie opens with this long take of bruce willis he's like completely drunk he's in a he's like in a limo he's at like this kind of speaking engagement and it's this really kind of frantic uh like tracking shot type thing where he's like getting ready and he's like hitting on every woman he sees and it's just like this really you know chaotic scene and then and then he starts to narrate the movie and then we jump over to the, the Tom Hanks story and the whole time I'm just like, why did we see all this like preamble stuff? Like, uh, am I supposed to now care about this character or something? Like, what does the movie have to say about Bruce Willis's character? Because he plays a pretty major role in it, but at the same time, what, what is it with this character other than the fact that he is a, an alcoholic journalist? Like, what it, is his arc? Yeah, it feels very much like a movie that wanted to give the movie a framing device and had no actual reason to. It's, yeah, it's so bizarre. And then the the fact that this is a Brian De Palma film, you have the all the kind of Brian De Palma staples in here as far as the visuals. But the problem is, like, they all feel completely tacked on. And it's almost as if Brian De Palma has his own little like filmmaking checklist 
that he like has these kind of prerequisites where he's like, okay, well I have to do split screen at some point. So we'll just fit it in here and that'll work. And then, okay, I got to do the, the, the split diopter shot. Okay. And I'll just like randomly put that in here and all of the sort of telltale signs of a Brian De Palma film are here, but most of them were completely pointless. Like, and they didn't add anything to the style of the, of the movie at all. Now there were a couple cool shots. I will give them that there's these like, there's these really cool. um, They're not overhead shots, but it's like a, like a reverse, like an underneath where, where the characters are looking down at the camera, like directly at the camera. And it happens a couple times. And I I really liked that. And there were a couple other, there were a couple other pieces of visual flair here and there that I, I liked. And the, the other kind of gimmicky type things, they looked good, but they just didn't add anything to the story. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm also reading a little bit more about this. I pulled this up. Uh, what, apparently, the it says here that one of the changes that was made for the adaptation was to make the Hanks character more sympathetic than he is portrayed in the novel. And I think no one involved in this production really reflected on the implication that what this movie looks like if you make that particular character more yeah. sympathetic. Yeah, see, that's the problem. That is the problem. You have a movie which should be telling a story about income inequality and and the the fact that during this time in New York City you had this this huge divide where you go to the Bronx and it's like literally on fire and then you go to like you know where Tom Hanks is I don't know I can't remember what neighborhood they were in but you know it's this beautiful white area and rather than looking at that, it it gets very muddled because even though Tom Hanks is this clearly unlikable guy, he is the, he's Tom Hanks. So you kind of like him by default. And it, it just gets very uh, confusing. It, it, it takes the, the film's com- commentary on wealth inequality and racism and puts it in a very uncomfortable place by putting making that character more sympathetic. Right, and the fact that like he wasn't the one driving and they I feel like they intentionally made Melanie Griffith's character more uh unlikable as a result. Like they they made her this like kind of southern belle and that she was like kind of inherently racist uh, because of, of that. Like, and I think that, I don't know if she was like that in the novel, but maybe they made her more unlikable to offset Tom Hanks, but that didn't really land either. Uh, It's just, Nothing about this is enjoyable. It's all just very, very bad. And this is, I'm saying this is a huge De Palma fan. I I like Brian De Palma a lot. And I think that this was just, uh, I think there were a lot of mistakes made with this one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a movie that has been so notorious for so long. I mean, the, the one thing I knew about it is, well, I pitched, when I pitched you this episode, I saw on Wikipedia the list of legal comedy films as it had been decided by an editor consisted of exactly four movies that were released in the 90s. And I know there were more, but they weren't on the list. Uh, for one, Serial Mom, I guess, would qualify under that. But even if it wasn't on the list, we already talked about it. And it was exactly four that were released in the 90s that we hadn't talked about. And this was one of them. And that was the hardest part I thought of trying to pitch this episode to you is like the only thing I knew about this movie going in is that it w- was so notorious for being bad that part of its legacy is that there's a book about the production of it uh, <laughs> and the very troubled production of it. And I've looked into more of that now. It was by uh, Julie Solomon, who was uh, a film critic for the Wall Street Journal at the time. And she was on set 
for almost the entire production of this movie, uh, chronicling it. And I haven't read the book, but I do want to now because apparently um, it does just go into like the granular detail of making a movie where at the time, you know, I guess you're you're on set, you're making a movie, just the, the process of it. You don't know if a movie's going to be good or bad then. And right. just tracking it through that entire process of making it, I think the TCM uh, did a podcast uh, of, of the production of this movie last year. So, and I think she hosted it. So, yeah, this is a movie that's legacy as a bad movie has far outpaced what one might know about the movie. And what one should know about the movie is that the movie is very bad. It's it just bad on, like, structural and textual levels, just completely misguided. Absolutely endless, just, there's just no sense of pace to it either, so it's in two hours and six minutes, and it feels so much longer. Well, it felt longer to me, because I kept not wanting to watch it, and I got caught between, I want to finish this, so it's not my whole day, but also I don't want to watch this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, so I started it in the early afternoon, and I ended it, like, at dusk. Like, I just finished it, and I just went outside and s stared into middle distance for a little while, just as <laughs> dusk fell, as just the sun was going down. I thought, I just need, I just need a moment <laughs> to myself <laughs> after this. Next, we'll be taking a look at perhaps the most popular and widely beloved court comedy of not just the 90s, but maybe of all time. Directed by Jonathan Lynn and released in theaters on March 13th, 1992, this is my cousin Vinny. Not since Perry Mason has a lawyer been so daring. Counselor. Not since General Custer. Good name book for murder. Has an outcome been so clear. Oh, fry him. They needed the best. How long have you been practicing? Almost six weeks. Whoa! What they got was... The two Utes. Did you say Utes? Yeah, two Utes. My Cousin Vinny. What is a Ute? Rated R. Starts Friday, March 13th at theaters everywhere. Two New Yorkers accused of murder in rural Alabama while on their way back to college call on the help of one of their cousins, a loudmouth lawyer with no trial experience. This is so much more pleasant to talk about than the Bonfire of the Vanities. I mean, it's like the polar opposite. You go from this, yeah. like, messy, stilted, just slog of a movie to a brisk, lean comedy that is just so kind of comforting this is i think that this is a movie that i that a lot of people will just you know it's like a it's like a warm blanket you know it's just uh it's a cozy movie if that makes any sense mm -hmm. and i think it's probably because this is a movie this is one of these movies that's on tv all the time yeah i was gonna say that it it, it does it's one of those movies that really does play very well in a TV setting. Yeah. It's uh it's a great movie. I adore this movie and I I mm -hmm. I would would dare somebody to if you don't like my cousin Vinny, I don't want to be friends with you because <laughs> what what do you want in a movie? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just it's it's great. I I don't know like to me this is almost it, it's a near perfect experience for me like i this is a movie that i could just rewatch endlessly i always enjoy myself i always laugh i'm always entertained i love that you know there's certain scenes that i just absolutely adore and it's great i mean any excuse i have to revisit this movie one of the interesting things though is like you know for this i i rewatched it I can't remember the last time that I voluntarily rewatched it. Every other time, maybe since I, the very first time I saw this, it was always on TV and I just watched it. And it, and it, it's never at the beginning either. Like anytime I tune in, it's, you know, towards the end of the court, the court case. And I, so I've probably only seen the beginning of this movie, like once or twice. And I almost, I, I probably only saw it once completely like the actual uh uncut version of this it's always i always end up seeing the the censored tv version yeah i've seen this movie twice now start to finish i watched it once a couple of years ago uh and yeah it, it's 
it just it's one of those movies that just plays well every time well i have a sample size of two but i can't imagine it'll change much on the third no it i i yeah it's uh i think it is a very rewatchable movie it has a set of really endearing likable characters i mean joe pesci and marissa tomei are on top of their game in this one uh is this the one she, marissa tomei got nominated for an oscar for this she won she? an oscar for this she won yeah there, yeah that's a little piece of like the worst kind of like you know pop cultural uh placement for how people think about the oscars was that there was this inane conspiracy theory for some years that she didn't actually win the oscar for this because they refused to accept i guess that uh someone could win for a comedy so there was this conspiracy theory that i think jack palance presented the oscar and that he just read the wrong name or something <laughs> uh which is a theory that could only exist as stupid as it was until you saw what actually happens when the wrong winner gets read out at the oscars <laughs> right yeah it's, it's a, yeah i mean it's a maybe perhaps it was an unexpected win uh i just but it's an astonishing performance. It's a she's so great in this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's she's incredible. I love I love Marissa Tomei, and I may, this might have been the first movie I saw her in. But yeah, she's she's just. And I just saw the that new Spider Man movie this week as well. So got a double dose of Marissa Tomei this week. How is the new Spider Man movie? It's good. Uh. Yeah, I'm not going to get too into it here, but it's yeah, uh, yeah. I, I liked it. I, I thought it was better than the, the last one. But uh, yeah, I mean, her her performance, the, the the you know, of course, the the big the big scene when she's on the stand and giving her uh, expert opinion great. on, on the scene. on the car like that. That is such an iconic scene. Uh, there, I mean, there's certain scenes in this movie that, that like people just remember, like the Utes, <laughs> like two mm-hmm. Utes, <laughs> like, th- I mean, that, that's just s- such an iconic scene. And then of course you have the, the wonderful, uh, Fred Gwynn as the, the judge, judge Chamberlain. And he's, he's great too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's, it's just a movie where it works really well throughout but just any scene in the courtroom and, and it just is absolutely electric. Yeah. Oh, it looks like this was his last, uh, looks like maybe this was his last on screen performance. Yeah. I think he died not long after this. Yeah. 93. I thought he was around a little bit longer than that. Hmm, that's sad. Yeah. You have uh, Ralph Macchio in here as well, which is interesting because this is like, you know, many, many years after karate kid, but he still looks the same. Like he still looks like a kid. Karate Kid in this, mm-hmm. which is, you know, Karate Kid came out in 84 and he looks like he hasn't aged at all. His role in this is not really anything, you know, it's 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 a pretty minor role, but mm-hmm. I, I don't know what else to say about this movie. Like, yeah. I feel, I yeah, feel like yeah. it's one of those kind of wildly popular movies that that, you know, anytime we cover a, a movie that is like extremely well known and popular it's it's like what is what is there to say about it it's it's great it's my cousin vinny you've probably seen it multiple times it's on tv probably right now if you haven't seen it you need to see it cuz i would say that it is the best courtroom comedy i can't really think of one that i that i think is better than my cousin vinny yeah it it's it's one of those movies or absolutely it it it's just what you do when you talk about when we talk about like great movies is where you just it's just I don't know what to say. This is a famous great movie and we agree it should be famous for being great. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's it really is a classic. I don't I yeah, I don't I don't really have anything else to add. It's well well worth a look. Our third title this month is a legal spoof from comedy master Carl Reiner, released on October 19th, 1993. This is Fatal Instinct. The reviews are in. Fatal Instinct's a killer comedy. I just laughed my head off. It's a real wiener. 
is the funniest movie I've seen since Naked Gun. I viewed it with relish. I don't think I'd recommend it to my mother. <laughs> I was absolutely grilled to my seat. I was in my seat. I was out of my seat. I couldn't stop. Fatal Instinct. Awesome. Rated PG-13. Now playing at theaters everywhere. A spoof on thrillers from before 1993, such as Fatal Attraction, 1987, Basic Instinct, 1992, Chinatown, 1974, Cape Fear, 1991, etc. A cop lawyer cheats on his wife and she on him and plans to kill him for the insurance. I, I was very much hoping you would read out the years that on, the, on that description. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> I like the etc. Yeah. <laughs> and other such movies. <laughs> and the rest. And you know, all, all the all the movies that we that we like. So this is a strange movie. I think it's it's a movie where I'm watching this movie and it is very well put together by Carl Reiner. It's a movie that is lean and well cast and well performed and well staged and well shot and most of the jokes aren't that funny. Yeah, I think that that's the that's kind of the core issue with this is that it's a spoof movie, you know, like The Naked Gun, Hot Shots, etc., all the all of those. Uh, but, you know, like like some of the more modern spoof movies I mean, I guess it's better than those, but regardless, it's a, it's a spoof movie that, that just doesn't really end up being funny at all. Like there's there's a few laughs here and there, and I imagine that if you were to sit down and watch this, there would be something that you would, you know, like find humorous. But comparing this to something like Airplane or even Hot Shots, like there's just no it's not even close. And and I, and and it's not to say that there there aren't like clever jokes and things here because there's actually a lot of really clever jokes and I think the story in and of itself is put together in a really interesting way because as the synopsis you know so eloquently put it does it does combine all of those movies it's like literally and, the it's literally the plot of all of those movies put and together more. and more et cetera. Etc. And it it works like it somehow presents this like pretty cohesive story, even though it's like a combination of like five or six different movies. And for that, I think it is impressive that that it is able to to somehow pull it together. Even though a lot of the you know threads are pretty pretty thin and some of it is just so ridiculous like the fact that he's a cop lawyer <laughs> he's a lawyer and a cop like it it's, but it, like that so i i liked that part of it the just the overall narrative i think that you know some of the jokes are are fine but like the the things that i found to be funniest like were dumb little like small things like i told you that when when the main the, the main character the cop lawyer played by uh, armando sante he there's a scene where he's shaving and yes. <laughs> just i don't know why but they like made the sound of him shaving like super loud and like yes. really defined and like coarse and mm -hmm. i thought that that was so funny i and i, I don't know why I Scene there two. was yeah. there was another scene that was kind of a similar joke where I can't even remember what it was, but they like heightened the sound of someone doing something, and I thought that that was funny as well. But I can't even remember what it was. Um, yeah, I think I know what you mean. But... It, yeah, it was a similar joke, but it was just it was something else. It wasn't shaving, but it was like something else. So yeah, it's kind of unfortunate. But like, if you look, if you compare this to airplane, airplane is rapid firing jokes at you at such a high speed that some of them are about are bound to land. Like they're, yeah. they're, you're just getting hit. You're just getting bombarded with jokes nonstop. This, it, 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 this is much more, uh, much more paced in, in how it's delivering the jokes. And as such, 
when you when it does do something like stupid like like the, the like his partner holding up the cue cards with the Miranda rights and yes. like just uh, dumb dumb stuff like that mm-hmm. Be- because you're not you know with with airplane whenever there's a dumb joke that that isn't going to work for you you already forgot about it cuz you're on cuz there've been 5 since then yes but with this it's not it's not like that it's so whenever you have something really really dumb on screen that's not funny it lingers and i think that that's like maybe maybe part, part of the problem bit. i think maybe just because i was feeling I, I i was just going in optimistic you know and i was just like that's a funny stupid joke at the start of the movie i mean i did it, i did find it funny when he tried to when he put the gum in his mouth over the ski mask <laughs> like you know there's this dumb yeah, no. you you never yeah. know you never know what's with a spoof yeah. movie you never know what's going to get you. It's going to be, it's bound to be yeah. something that you wouldn't normally be like, yeah, that's funny. That made me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think that's an observation I've had about airplane. I haven't rewatched airplane in a while, but the, the thing that sort of has occurred to me about that is just that the same thing that you've observed. I think a large proportion of the jokes in the movie, I don't find particularly funny, but just the, it, what gets you is just the sheer, just, propulsion of it Mm -hmm. and i i'm i would argue that that and and i wouldn't say that airplane is is this but some comedies uh i don't necessarily think are even funny but i still enjoy them like tremendously i i recently on the regular on the weekly podcast was talking about kids in the hall and that's a show that we should probably discuss at some point on this podcast since kids in the hall was a very 90s show and um even though it its first season debuted in 89 the i i think that a lot of the sketches on kids in the hall are not particularly funny but it's sort of like a i feel like they're sort of a precursor to that like anti-comedy like tim and eric style of thing where it's so irreverent and so out there that even though it might not make you laugh they're still an undeniable humor about it, which, which I can appreciate, even if it's not something that's going to be, you know, making, making me slap my knee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But fatal instinct is, does not have that. Like that's not fatal instinct. No, I, I, but I think it, there are times when it feels like it gets closer to that than, you would expect it to just because it's a very efficiently made movie from every respect other than the jokes, Mm -hmm. which is a hard thing to explain about a comedy, but all of the ingredients are there to be a movie that almost doesn't need the, like it's a movie that is so well made that I feel like a couple of the things that I might've laughed at, I would not have otherwise laughed under any other circumstance, but the execution of it is just good enough to push it over the line for me. Yeah, yeah. I think that they're, uh, yeah, it is it is definitely on another level compared to, again, like modern, like epic movie and like those modern spoof movies. I would say that this is probably... One of those that the men there. <laughs> I would say that, the, that this is probably also a level above something like even uh, Top Secret and some of the, some of the older spoof movies too. Johnny Dangerously, I think I have a, a soft spot for Johnny Dangerously since I was a big fan of that. But like Loaded Weapon, like that that's another one that I think is kind of on a similar vein to this. I think that maybe this works a, a bit better than Loaded Weapon. But uh, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's it's a spoof movie. I've seen it before. So this is this, the second time I've seen this movie. Uh, and it's... Yeah, it's uh, I I enjoyed myself with it for the most part. I would just say don't go in expecting to uh, get a lot of belly laughs out of it, but maybe a few chuckles here and there. Yeah, it's it's a movie where the point that I think we keep arriving at is 
all on that particular just kind of middling level where it is the execution that's going to help it out a lot. So it's just like, I don't know what I don't know what I'm getting at here. It's like, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, Carl Reiner is is good at doing comedy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he, I mean, he, you have a lot of faces and names in in here that I think are cast very well. Uh, Sean Young, in particular, like she has, she always has been able to to do the like crazy woman. Uh, character so well and I think that she she is uh, very very expertly cast here and then you have uh, Sherilyn Fenn as well and she's she's great Armando Sante is fine I didn't I didn't really have a strong opinion about him in this role one way or the other he's got a uh, lot of dead and stuff to do and I think he does some of it pretty well yeah, yeah, he he does play sort of the the, the straight man role, mm. and the the whole like shtick is that he's he's a cop and a lawyer, so he has no time. He does both, but he's also like really dumb. Like, and I like that they I like that they establish because like in a movie like like um uh Naked Gun, any of the Leslie Nielsen spoofs, like. It's never really established, and I guess you could say the same about Hot Shots. Like, the main characters are complete idiots. They're complete morons, but it's never established within the context of the movie itself. You know, like, they're, they're, they're still, like, Leslie Nielsen is still, like, an expert cop, and Charlie Sheen is, like, this Rambo type, and or, or Maverick, or whatever, you know, movie they're spoofing. And they establish early on that that Ned Ned Ravine is a a dummy like he's not he's not smart and everybody knows that he's not smart he's an idiot so i kind of liked that yeah but I, yeah i don't really have anything else to add about this it's it's a uh, meh it's a meh for me yeah it it, it it's it's one of those things where I would not be surprised if it did have a life at one point on television. Uh, and in contrast to some movies like uh, My Cousin Vinny, where you see it on TV and then you feel like you kind of have to stay with it. Um, this, I think, would have had a really interesting life maybe as a movie that you stay with for one block while you're channel surfing. And then when it goes <laughs> to commercial, you go to something else. Yeah. <laughs> Is this on Tubi? I feel like this would definitely be. Yes, a- this was the one that was on Tubi. I was looking yeah. at where these movies were available to watch, and this I was on Prime, though it leaves at the end of this month. So yeah, get on that, everyone. And it's also on Tubi. It feels like Tubi is a good home for for yes. this movie. All right, our final title is an outrageous comedy starring the one and only Jim Carrey as a lawyer who can't lie. Directed by Tom Shadiak and released on March 21st, 1997. This is Liar Liar. Liar Liar is the number one movie in America. That's right. The New York Times raves it's uproarious. Oh, and Siskel and Ebert give it two thumbs up. Liar Liar. What's up, Fletcher? Your cholesterol. Rated PG-13. Now playing. A fast track lawyer can't lie for 24 hours due to his son's birthday wish after he disappoints his son for the last time. <laughs> nice. That's a good one. It's That's a good great, one. Great great writing. Uh, so, Adam, what do you think of Liar Liar? I remember when I saw this movie when I was a kid, I, I liked it. I, I don't remember loving it or anything. I did like it as a kid. I liked pretty much all Jim Carrey stuff as a kid. I was very bothered by Ace Ventura because... You're probably too young to remember this, but back when Ace Ventura came out, it was probably the most quoted movie I had ever witnessed at that point in my entire life. And everybody quoted that movie nonstop, and it was the most annoying thing ever. And I liked Ace Ventura, but the fact that every kid in school would quote it nonstop made me kind of hate it. And then like 
Austin Powers came out and everybody started quoting that. And people were still quoting Beavis and Butthead, I think, at this time, too, doing their their great Beavis and Butthead impersonations. And that was, you know, later on, then South Park came out and everybody was doing Cartman. I just, I hate media properties that cause people to do impersonations. Borat, uh, <laughs> like, just all, all of it. I hate it all so much. Be- and usually because whatever the impression is from whatever it is tv movie whatever it's usually good and i feel like when you have like dude bros or or in the case of ace ventura like you know 10 year old kids doing the these impersonations it just drives me crazy and it's so bad but anyway i thought that that liar liar was fine as a kid revisiting net it now as an adult I found it to be somewhat grating and the whole time, instead of just enjoying it for like a goofy comedy, uh, somewhat family friendly comedy, I just couldn't get over like trying to figure out the logic of how yeah, th- this, this forced truth telling worked <laughs> like, like just, just trying to, cause it seemed like, it was some sort of like, it like forced him to say things because a lot of stuff it's like, you don't have to lie, but, but it's like, is he just a bad person? You know what I mean? Like, like when he's, when he's like fat shaming that guy and like making fun of people and like talking about the, the the woman's boobs and stuff like you can say things to people and have it be the truth and not be horrible. I I think maybe what it is, is that he has to externalize all of his inner thoughts and his inner thoughts and impressions are just really bad. and, And see, yes, I think that's what it is, but, but that's not, that's not the same as not being able to lie. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, I f- so I feel like the rules in this are a little bit strange. I mean, I, I like I like the concept, a lawyer who can't lie. Uh, I feel like maybe maybe they could have capitalized on it a little bit more instead of just one day. Like, why would the it's interesting that the kid and I also ha- find it hard to believe that the kid would just be like, oh, I wish for just one day my dad couldn't lie. Mm-hmm. Every kid on planet Earth would wish for, oh, I wish my dad couldn't lie. They wouldn't, they wouldn't put a time, time yeah. limit on it. Like, no, no kid would do that. No adult would do that. Why would you? You know? So I, I, I feel like that was a little bit of a mm, missed opportunity there. I enjoyed this movie on a certain level. Like, I think it's a movie that I would that could have been like, I think when we're talking about movies that didn't necessarily make us laugh, but I, we enjoyed watching. This is oddly was that for me, which is after the immediate novelty of watching Carrie as this character who finds himself in this existentially agonizing situation for him. It's not terribly funny. Like it's all that concept. Like the concept of it is almost funnier than the actual reality of it. But just watching him do what he does, it, I think I was able to watch for a lot longer. Yeah, I mean, like, this is I, this was you know released in, in peak. This is like peak yeah. carry. Uh-huh. Like this this is this is before he really tried to get away from the whole kind of rubber face type physical comedy. Like he was still really embracing that during this time. And a lot of his roles were still that, that type of character. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's good. It, it, it works. I like yeah. it. To, to be clear, I, I like the movie. I just found it to be a little bit more, abrasive than i think when i was a kid well that makes sense it, it is it, it can get a bit wearing even at a understandably i think the film understands it's what 86 minutes and there's a bunch of like outtakes over the end credits so it's probably about 80 minutes yeah which i, I like a, by the way that's a good length for this by the way uh mm-hmm. 
any comedy, any comedy or action movie, put in outtakes. Just put them in the credits. Everybody loves outtakes. Just put mm-hmm. them in there. Mm-hmm. The old you, you instantly get bonus points for for me when you when you put in some goofy outtakes in the credits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's a. This isn't another movie that I would kind of lump into that um, almost like kind of a comfort food type of of movie. I don't know how much TV play that this one got, but uh, to me, it's it's a movie that feels very kind of quint- quintessential mid nineties, uh, like safe comedy, and there were a, a lot of these. And, you know, I'm thinking of like Mrs. Doubtfire, that type where you have these like kind of family comedies and there's like some kind of hook, some something going on, something mix things up a bit. I also noticed that like uh, this, w- this was still during during a time when like divorce, uh, like depictions of divorce were like every movie, like every movie it was the 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 parents were divorced. and. Not everyone, but I would say like at least half of them, they get back together at the end of the movie, which I think is like a really bad, uh, a bad thing to do in these types of movies. Hmm. Yeah. Just setting these like weird, unrealistic expectations and like Carrie Elway's character, like he was a good guy, you know? Yeah. He yeah. Good... It does, the movie does not villainize him, which I think is fair. <laughs> No, it, it it just makes him boring and like yeah, it, it, he's completely inessential in a certain way. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I, but I also think like, is it did did he do enough? Did Jim Carrey's character do enough to and not just like you know win back like prevent his his ex wife and son from moving to to Boston, but like get back together with his ex wife? Like, was that enough? What he did. Yeah, I, I, like I, I don't know. I, I think, I think that there he would have to put in some more work, you know, to prove himself. Showing up once, <laughs> and and plus, like they say, they say early at the beginning of the movie that the reason that they got divorced was because he was cheating on her, which is a pretty big deal. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so I don't know, man. I feel like it wasn't quite earned that ending. Yeah, it's an ending that does not make any sense on a certain level, but is also the only way this movie could have ended. <laughs> Give, given the given the year uh, that this yes. came out, yeah, I, I agree mm-hmm. with you. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, the other way that they could have done it would be uh, a uh, a Santa Claus type of thing, where like the 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 new the new guy like kind of comes around and they become friends or something that could happen too I guess I will say when we're talking about movies that give themselves to excessive uh, impression making from people who see it this feels like a good movie to not do that because you can't watch this movie and look at Carrie and think I bet I could do an impression of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you you can't really and the the whole the, the whole thing with like the ace ventura thing is because of the specific lines yeah. you know th- this one is much more yeah is much more physical based although like you know there's th- they're definitely quotables in this i distinctly remember a lot of people quoting him uh his reaction to the the woman in the elevator the first time uh where he just kept commenting on her boobs like that. I, I remember that being a very quoted line. And there are a couple other things here and there, but yeah, like comparing this to something like dumb and dumber or Ace Ventura, like it's not anywhere close to being as uh, memorable, like as far as like specific scenes or, or bits of dialogue. Yeah. And, and to be clear, like, I don't think that this is anywhere close to being on the same level as dumb and dumber or, uh, Ace Ventura, which I don't think we've talked about either of those movies. No, we gotta no. we gotta get on that. 
<laughs> the the mid nineties comedies, man, like the the Fairly Brothers era, like that whole man. You gotta dive into that. It's good stuff. Anyway, uh yeah, I think it's I think it's a movie that holds up pretty well. It's down yeah, there's some questionable representation of women in this, but yeah, that's pretty well, par, pretty much par for the course. Yeah, when you, when you said that what people were quoting was his dialogue to the woman in the elevator, that's in the yeah. was like really that's what people were going with. Yep, that's what it was. I I uh, not a huge fan of that. No, no. Nope. Um. Yeah, that's pretty pretty much it. Do you have anything else to add about this one? Uh, not a ton, really. Um, I don't know. So this show's gonna probably come off, uh, come out as being one of our shorter episodes. Yeah. Uh, I think one because there's we. It's my cousin Vinny's movie that you just like so much that it's like, what are you gonna say about it? Everything else has already been said. It's you know, I think this month is the 30th anniversary of my cousin Vinny or. Yeah, thirtieth. Um, so I'm sure there's been a lot more appraisals of it this month. And then you get to the point where I was wondering to you yesterday offline. I was talking about how it was good that chronologically the bonfire of the vanities came first, so we could just get that out of the way and then move on to other movies instead of having that like be last, and then we just spend the whole show watching it get closer and closer and closer. <laughs> And just dreading yeah. it, like just <laughs> yeah, just hovering over us for the show. But I don't know. Maybe that just tired us out too much. Could be. Could be. Yeah. It's like okay, we spent more time than we than we wanted to talk about the bonfire of the vanities. We won't have to talk about the rest of the movies this month in twenty five minutes. Well, I think that part of that is because the rest of the movies, I just don't have really strong feelings towards one way or the other. Like I really like my cousin Vinny. I think it's a classic blah, 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 but it's not like I'm getting a, my cousin Vinny tattoo tomorrow, you know, like, like it's a, it's a good, it's a great movie. I like it a lot, but it's not like I have a whole lot to say about it. And I think the same can be said about the other two as well. Fatal instinct. I don't think is a really very good movie. And Liar Liar, I think is fine, but it's, you know, you're, I think as, uh, as far as like the, the, the Jim Carrey, uh, filmography, it's probably somewhere in the middle too. So it's like, eh, you know, not a lot, yeah, yeah. not a lot to say about that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's always interesting to see how the four movies that we choose go together. Like I was came up with this idea because I saw that list and I was able, and it was four. So like, I think part of the challenge is we'll come up with a theme and then we'll have to figure out what movies fit within that theme. And and two two of the, two of the four were March movies too. Yeah. And that was also a good thing too. I knew it was my cousin Vinny came out in March of 92. So I start on there when I see it and then it's liar, liar turned, I think 97. So 25 years old this month. It's just one where the whole episode came together just from by me looking at one list, and I was able to give you like a fully formed lineup, um, like which is rare. Happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it when that happens. Although, Usually you know, it, it's, it's, yeah. sometimes it leads to to really interesting pairings. Yeah, and f- yeah, finding that's like a, that's the case here. Yeah, like finding like kind of obscure things and like more obtuse themes and stuff. Yeah, it's, sometimes listeners, it'll be, it, there's just nothing organically happening. There's just nothing that pops out. So it'll be like the 10th or 11th or 12th day of the month. And we'll just be like, we could do this and it gets us two movies. And then we have to figure out two more. <laughs> thrillers. <laughs> yeah. Lots of, yeah. Lots of thrillers. <laughs> yeah, if our listeners remember the run last year when we did like five thriller episodes in a row. <laughs> it was like sci-fi thrillers, legal thrillers. <laughs> thrillers. <laughs> I think we just did one that was just more thrillers. I don't think we actually came up with a theme for it. I mean, the 90s was a big decade for the thriller. That's for sure. It was. It was. Uh, I, do, I haven't seen it yet, but I do want to see that uh, 
Adrian, new Adrian Line movie that dropped, I think, on Hulu the other day. Affleck and uh, Ben Affleck and Anna de Armas. Deep, deep Water? Is deep Water. Name? It's yeah. Adrian Line's first movie in 20 years. I, uh, you know, I actually have no desire to see that. Ah. I don't know why. Just does not appeal to me at all. I mean, I'll probably catch up with it at some point, but interestingly, uh, we, you know, uh, when was that? A couple, it was in January, we did the Y2K episode, and I just, uh, I was watching some South by Southwest stuff this past week, and there was a movie that takes place on New Year's Eve in 1999, and it's about friends trying to get to a Y2K party. Does it involve a potential nuclear meltdown? Uh, no, it doesn't actually. They they don't really talk about the Y two K bug at all in it. Mm-hmm. So, missed opportunity there. All right. Well, I think that that's going to wrap it up for this month. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can send us your nineties memories at nineties at filmpulse dot net or by sending us a DM on Twitter, or Facebook at nineties pod. Until next month, for Ken Bakley, my name's Adam Patterson. This has been Saved by the Nineties. Bye, everyone. Bye.